Section fifteen of the House of the Vampire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. The House of the Vampire by George Sylvester Virick. Chapter twenty nine. The next morning's mail brought a letter from Ethel, a few lines of encouragement and affection. Yes, she was right. It would not do for him to stay under one roof with Reginald any longer. He must only obtain the manuscript and, if possible, surprise him in the attempt to exercise his mysterious and criminal power. Then he would be in the position to dictate terms and to demand Jack's safety as the price of his silence. Reginald, however, had closeted himself that day in his studio busily writing. Only the clatter of his typewriter announced his presence in the house. There was no chance for conversation, or for obtaining the precious manuscript of Leontina. Meanwhile Ernest was looking over his papers and preparing everything for a quick departure. Glancing over old letters and notes, he became readily interested and hardly noticed the passage of the hours. When the night came he only partly undressed and threw himself upon the bed. It was now ten. At twelve he had promised Ethel to speak to her over the telephone. He was determined not to sleep at all that night. At last he would discover whether or not the previous night and other nights Reginald had secretly entered his room. When one hour had passed without incident, his attention relaxed a little. His eyes were gradually closing, when suddenly something seemed to stir at the door. The Chinese vase came rattling to the floor. At once Ernest sprang up. His face had blanched with terror. It was whiter than the linen in which they wrap the dead. But his soul was resolute. He touched a button, and the electric light illuminated the whole chamber. There was no nook for even a shadow to hide. Yet there was no one to be seen. From without the door came no sound. Suddenly something soft touched his foot. He gathered all his will-power so as not to break out into a frenzied shriek. Then he laughed, not a hearty laugh, to be sure. A tiny nose and tail gracefully curled were brushing against him. The source of the disturbance was a little Maltese cat, his favourite, that by some chance had remained in his room. After its essay at midnight gymnastics, the animal quieted down and lay purring at the foot of his bed. The presence of a living thing was a certain comfort, and the reservoir of his strength was well-nigh exhausted. He dimly remembered his promise to Ethel, but his lids drooped with sheer weariness. Perhaps an hour passed in this way, when suddenly his blood congealed with dread. He felt the presence of the hand of Reginald Clark unmistakably groping in his brain, as if searching for something that had still escaped him. He tried to move, to cry out, but his limbs were paralyzed. When by a superhuman effort he at last succeeded in shaking off the numbness that held him enchained, he awoke just in time to see a figure, that of a man, disappearing in the wall that separated Reginald's apartments from his room. This time it was no delusion of the senses. He heard something like a secret door softly closing behind retreating steps. A sudden fierce anger seized him. He was oblivious of the danger of the terrible power of the older man, oblivious of the love he had once borne him, oblivious of everything save the sense of outraged humanity and outraged right. The law permits us to shoot a burglar who goes through our pockets at night. Must he tolerate the ravages of this a thousand times more dastardly and dangerous spiritual thief? Was Reginald to enjoy the fruit of other men's labor unpunished? Was he to continue growing into the mightiest literary factor of the century by preying upon his betters? Abel, Wacom, Ethel, he, Jack, were they all to be victims of this insatiable monster? Was this force resistless as it was relentless? No. A thousand times no. He dashed himself against the wall at the place where the shadow of Reginald Clark had disappeared. In doing so he touched upon a secret spring. The wall gave way noiselessly. Speechless with rage he crossed the next room and the one adjoining it, and stood in Reginald's studio. The room was brilliantly lighted, and Reginald, still dressed, was seated at his writing-table scribbling notes upon little scraps of paper in his accustomed manner. At Ernest's approach he looked up without evincing the least sign of terror or surprise. Calmly, almost majestically, he folded his arms over his breast, but there was a menacing glitter in his eyes as he confronted his victim. CHAPTER Thirty. Silently the two men faced each other. Then Ernest hissed. Thief! Reginald shrugged his shoulders. Vampire! 
So Ethel has infected you with her absurd fancies. Poor boy! I am afraid. I have been wanting to tell you for some time. But I think we have reached the parting of our road. And that you dare to tell me? The more he raged, the calmer Reginald seemed to become. Really, he said, I fail to understand. I must ask you to leave my room. You fail to understand? You cad! Ernest cried. He stepped to the writing-table and opened the secret drawer with a blow. A bundle of manuscripts fell on the floor with a strange rustling noise. Then, seizing his own story, he hurled it upon the table. And behold, the last pages bore corrections in ink that could have been made only a few minutes ago. Reginald smiled. "'Have you come to play havoc with my manuscripts?' he remarked. "'Your manuscripts! Reginald Clark, you are an impudent impostor. You have written no word that is your own. You are an embezzler of the mind, strutting through life in borrowed and stolen plumes.' And at once the mask fell from Reginald's face. "'Why stolen?' he coolly said, with a slight touch of irritation. "'I absorb. I appropriate. That is the most any artist can say for himself. God creates, man moulds. He gives us the colours, we mix them. That is not the question. I charge you with having wilfully and criminally interfered in my life. I charge you with having robbed me of what was mine. I charge you with being utterly vile and rapacious, a hypocrite and a parasite." "'Foolish boy,' Reginald rejoined austerely. "'It is through me that the best in you shall survive, even as the obscure Elizabethans live in him of Avon. Shakespeare absorbed what was great in little men, a greatness that otherwise would have perished, and gave it a setting, a life. A thief may plead the same. I understand you better. It is your inordinate vanity that prompts you to abuse your monstrous power. You err. Self-love has never entered into my actions. I am careless of personal fame. Look at me, boy. As I stand before you, I am Homer. I am Shakespeare. I am every cosmic manifestation in art. Men have doubted in each incarnation my individual existence. Historians have more to tell of the meanest Athenian scribble or Elizabethan poetaster than of me. The radiance of my work obscured my very self. I care not. I have a mission. I am the servant of the Lord. I am the vessel that bears the host." He stood up at full length, the personification of grandeur and power. A tremendous force trembled in his very fingertips. He was like a gigantic dynamo, charged with the might of ten thousand magnetic storms that shake the earth in its orbit and lash myriads of planets through infinities of space. Under ordinary circumstances Ernest or any other man would have quailed before him. But the boy in that epic moment had grown out of his stature. He felt the sword of vengeance in his hands. To him was entrusted the cause of Abel and of Wacom, of Ethel and of Jack. His was the struggle of the individual soul against the same blind and cruel fate that in the past had fashioned the Ichthyosaurus and the Mastodon. "'By what right?' he cried. "'Do you assume that you are the literary messiah?' Who appointed you? What divine powers made you the steward of my might and of theirs whom you have robbed? I am a light-bearer. I tread the high hills of mankind. I point the way to the future. I light up the abysses of the past. Were not my stature gigantic, how could I hold the torch in all men's sight? The very souls that I tread underfoot realize, as their dying gaze follows me, the possibilities with which the future is big. Eternally secure, I carry the essence of what is cosmic, of what is divine. I am Homer, Goethe, Shakespeare. I am an embodiment of the same force of which Alexander, Caesar, Confucius, and the Christos were also embodiments. None so strong as to resist me." A sudden madness overcame Ernest at this boast. He must strike now or never. He must rid humanity of this dangerous maniac, this demon of strength. With the power ten times intensified, he raised a heavy chair so as to hurl it at Reginald's head and crush it. Reginald stood there calmly, a smile upon his lips. Primal cruelties rose from the depth of his nature. Still he smiled, turning his luminous gaze upon the boy. And behold, Ernest's hand began to shake, the chair fell from his grasp, he tried to call for help, 
but no sound issued from his lips. Utterly paralyzed, he confronted the Force. Minutes, eternities passed, and still those eyes were fixed upon him. But this was no longer Reginald. It was all brain, only brain, a tremendous brain machine, infinitely complex, infinitely strong. Not more than a mile away Ethel endeavored to call to him through the night. The telephone rang once, twice, thrice, insistingly, but Ernest heard it not. Something dragged him, dragged the nerves from his body, dragged, dragged, dragged. It was an irresistible suction, pitiless, passionless, immense. Sparks, blue, crimson, and violet seemed to play around the living battery. It reached the finest fibers of his mind. Slowly every trace of mentality disappeared. First the will, then feeling, judgment, memory, fear even. All that was stored in his brain cells came forth to be absorbed by that mighty engine. The princess with the yellow veil appeared, flitted across the room and melted away. She was followed by childhood memories, girls' heads, boys' faces. He saw his dead mother waving her arms to him. An expression of death agony distorted the placid features. Then throwing a kiss to him she too disappeared. Picture on picture followed. Words of love that he had spoken, sins, virtues, magnanimities, meannesses, terrors, mathematical formulas even, and snatches of songs. Leontina came and was swallowed up. No, it was Ethel who was trying to speak to him, trying to warn. She waved her hands in frantic despair. She was gone. A pale face, dark, disheveled hair. Jack! How he had changed! He was in the circle of the vampire's transforming might. Jack! he cried. Surely Jack had something to explain, something to tell him. Some word that if spoken would bring rest to his soul. He saw the words rise to the boy's lips, but before he had time to utter them his image also had vanished. And Reginald, Reginald too was gone. There was only the mighty brain, panting, whirling. Then there was nothing. The annihilation of Ernest Fielding was complete. Vacantly he stared at the walls, at the room, and at his master. The latter was wiping the sweat from his forehead. He breathed deeply. The flush of youth spread over his features. His eyes sparkled with a new and dangerous brilliancy. He took the thing that had once been Ernest Fielding by the hand and led it to its room. CHAPTER Thirty One. With the first flush of the morning Ethel appeared at the door of the house on Riverside Drive. She had not heard from Ernest, and had been unable to obtain connection with him at the telephone. Anxiety had hastened her steps. She brushed against Jack, who was also directing his steps to the abode of Reginald Clark. At the same time, something that resembled Ernest Fielding passed from the house of the vampire. It was a dull and brutish thing, hideously transformed, without a vestige of mind. "'Mr. Fielding!' cried Ethel, beside herself with fear as she saw him descending. "'Ernest!' Jack gasped no less startled at the change in his friend's appearance. Ernest's head followed the source of the sound, but no spark of recognition illumined the deadness of his eyes. Without a present and without a past, blindly, a gibbering idiot, he stumbled down the stairs. End of section 15 End of the House of the Vampire by George Sylvester Virick.